Hey everyone, it's Lee at My Productive Mac here. And today I'm dropping the first part of a small series that I'm gonna do that looks at the basics of one of my most used applications. Now DevonThink is, in my view, and in the view of many others, an amazing piece of software for managing files, knowledge, helping keep research organized. In fact, it's really difficult to pigeonhole exactly what it can do for you because it offers so much. Now myself, I use it extensively for file management. I don't store much natively on my Mac in like my documents folder or iCloud drive. In fact, 90% of my files sit in here and they're very easy to get to because the AI that Devon Think has been running with, way before it was on trend, might I add, means filing and retrieving your stuff is simple. The databases are easy to back up and you can view and edit most of your documents natively within Devon Think without having to use an external application. Now, if you have the pro version, you can attach a scanner to import physical documents and create a paperless office, something that I do regularly myself. And DevonThink will carry out OCR or optical character recognition on those files to make them searchable. You can use smart rules to automatically file documents. Now, I use this quite aggressively, especially for my company invoices and receipts. I don't want to manually file those. So DevonThink looks at the contents of the files locally on my machine and then moves it to the right location based on the rules that I have set. And they're easy to find because of the amazing search that is baked in. Smart groups will allow you to use save searches so that you don't have to repeat the same search criteria for a file that you have to access regularly. You can use tags to add further complexities or simplicities to your file structure. And there's so much here that we're gonna to be touching on over the coming weeks like encrypting your databases using the DevonThink inbox, linking to files in DevonThink from other apps. There's just so much to this application. It's truly like a behemoth. Now I wanna kick off though, by just looking at the different versions of DevonThink that you can get. And it's improved from the old days where there were a number of different versions that were quite tricky to differentiate between. We now just have three. We've got standard, pro and server. Now standard does a lot. In fact, it does most of the things that we've just covered on the product page. However, all of these features here on the left will not be included. So if you want OCR, which as said is the ability to search your PDFs, that's a pro feature and a good reason in my opinion to have that version. Now you're not gonna need most of these for the basic functionality that DevonThink can give you. And the server offers a web interface which makes it much easier to share databases within a team. However, it is considerably more expensive. In fact, if we look, the standard version is just under $100 at the moment, then it's $200 for the Pro and $500 for the server version. Right, let's kick on and get DevonThink running. I'm going to open it with my app launcher. And you can see we've got a welcome screen that appears. And ordinarily, you may be of a mind to just close and stop this from appearing every time you run DevonThink. But if you're just getting into the app, I'd actually urge you not to do that because there is a lot of stuff in here that's gonna help you. They've been really clever with their space and how this is organized. So here, for example, is a get support link that provides you with a few resources you might need like links to FAQs, the blog, forums, etc. And then you can get back to the welcome screen by clicking welcome here. Now there's a setup link here as well. And this gives you some clear guidance and articles on how to create a database, install add-ons, and customize your DevonThink interface and experience. This link here for installing extras has a load of scripts that you can run from DevonThink in one easy location for installing. And as well as this, we've got some sample smart rules and templates as well. 90% of which you're probably never gonna need, but these give you an idea as to some of the things that you can actually do with DevonThink. Then under tips and tutorials, there's a wide range of tutorials. Some of them are video based, some of them are text driven, and they give you an easy to follow guide on some of the features that are available. And there can be quite a learning curve with them and think. And I'd keep that welcome screen on as you start. But if you don't want it, just uncheck and close. Now, irrespective of the version of Dev and Think that you get, there is a generous trial period for you to play with before committing. You can click here to take you to a web page that allows you to purchase. And once you have to enter the license, just click up here, come down to enter license and register. Right, so I'm licensed, so let's take a look at adding the first database in here. Now this is a very simple process, it's just a couple of elements that need a little bit of careful consideration. So file, and new database, let's give it a name. So this is a database that's gonna hold all of my recipes. Now the location of the database is important. Now I always go with the default, which if we look, is actually in the root of the user directory. 
Now, I would strongly advise against storing in any kind of cloud storage system, such as Dropbox or iCloud Drive, because this can create some consistency issues, given the fact that this is a database file that's going to be created. So I'll stick with the defaults and click Create. Now, my database is there, quick and easy. And over here in the left sidebar, I can expand the database name. And whilst it's, of course, empty, we do have some smart groups that have been preloaded in there. And dependent on the layout that you have of the interface here, you'll see the contents of the database in a window over here. So with this view, we can see it's at the top with a reading pane at the bottom. This view here gets rid of that reading pane below. And then we can also put the reading pane on the right if we like, but I'll get it back to normal here. So that's creating a normal database. Now you can create an encrypted database that uses AES256 encryption and a password to unlock. And it's as easy to set up an encrypted one as an unencrypted one. So I'll select it here, give it a name. So down here, we need to specify the password and of course, verify it. Now with the encrypted database, because it is a larger size than an unencrypted one, you can set a maximum size for it. So play about with these drop downs here to give you the maximum size that you think you're going to need. And you can create a spotlight index if you wish, but these results of course are not encrypted because spotlight doesn't have the password to unlock your database. Then when you're happy, click save. And we now have an encrypted database over here on the left. So I can see straight away it is encrypted because of the key to the right of the database name. And now I'm going to need a password each time I open it. So if I right click and come down to close database, it now appears in my recent databases list down here. And if I click on it to open, I now need a password to get in. And there we are, the database is open, but everything's asking me if I want the database to be searchable in Spotlight. Well, I don't, and I'll check here to not ask me again. Okay, I just paused and added some bits into the database here. So we've got a couple of folders or groups as they're called in Dev and Think. I can expand them, see what's in there. And there's a bit of a mixture between PDF files and web bookmarks as we start out. And you can see that the same structure is over here. At least the groups and the smart groups are displayed there anyway. And the number of items that's in each one is displayed next to the group. We are talking about databases today though. So let's take a look at the properties of a database and see what we can tweak. I'll right click and come down to database properties. Now there isn't too much that we can configure here, but there's enough to just warrant me showing you through it. So at the top, you can see the database path. And then below that, if you want to have a spotlight index to make it easier to search for Dev and Think items from within Spotlight, then you can check that here. And if you're having issues with your database, maybe consistency checks are failing or is erroring for any reason, then you can rebuild it. Although touch wood, I've never had to do that, but never say never, as they say. And then below that, you can change the name of the database and add in a comment to describe it if you've got a lot of different ones here. And let's just spend a bit of time going through these three options because it's not immediately obvious what they do, especially if you're just starting out. So exclude groups from tagging is the first one. Now, DevonThink allows you to tag files and each file can have multiple tags. Now you can, if you wish, have the groups or folders, if it's easier to understand that way, treated as tags as well. Let me show you. Currently that behavior is switched off. So I'll come out of here and highlight a file. Now it's currently a member of the BBC Good Food group here, but that as we've seen is not a tag. And this icon here that looks a little bit like a folder isn't a tag either, it's a group icon. Now in the inspector over here on the right, I can see that I've actually put three tags on this file. We've got desserts, we've got easy and nuts. Now let's bring the properties back up once more. And this time I'm gonna uncheck it and come back. Now these groups have now converted to tag icons. And if I just click away and come back to the Bakewell recipe over here, BBC Good Food is now a tag. Now is this behavior good or bad? Well, that's totally not my call. It's all dependent on how you like to have your tags structured. Some people absolutely love this behavior, others not so. So simply check or uncheck it based on your own preferences. Then next we have inherit tags of groups and this one is simpler. You can have a hierarchical list of tags, so sub tags, I guess you could call them. And if you wanna have all of the tags in that hierarchy applied to your file, check this. 
And finally, at the bottom, we have case insensitive tagging. Now this determines whether you can have a tag duplicated on an item, but with different cases on its letters. This is actually easier to show you. It's unchecked right now. And over here we have nuts as a tag and you can see it's got a capital N. Now I'll add nuts as a tag all lowercase and we can see it's accepted. We've got two tags there now. If I come back into properties and check this box once more, I'm going to come in here and just delete that original tag. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to type in a lowercase n and nuts. And look, it doesn't let it appear in lowercase. It converts it to uppercase. If I press, say, Shift and M for a capital M for medium, I can see a capital M is going to appear. But if I do lowercase, it displays an uppercase one once more. So this helps prevent having duplicate tags because of simple capitalization errors. OK, just come back into properties quickly once more. And you can see here that if the database is unencrypted, you can convert it to an encrypted one by giving it a password. Right, to close off this intro into databases, I thought it'd be worth spending just a minute on what the database file itself actually looks like. So let me just get to the two files that I created earlier. And there we can see the NPM finances one, which is encrypted, and the recipes one, which is just a standard database. And you can see there is a small overhead that is involved in an encrypted database. I've got just the one text file in that NPM finances one, and it's sitting at 130 meg as opposed to the 18 meg of the one below that has around 15 or so very small files and links in there. Also, the file types you can see are different. So recipes is a DevonThink database and the encrypted one is called a sparse disk image. Now, if you double click on the database one, you can see it opens up in DevonThink as you would expect. But if you want to see how it's actually constructed, then right click, go to show package contents, and we've got a lot of stuff in there that helps structure it and your files. Well, if I expand this files.no index folder, then this PDF one, which is where my PDF files are in that database, we can see they're all split up into all of these different subfolders. And there is no way I'd be able to understand the logic behind this structure and nor should you. But the reason I'm showing you this is to show you that the files are stored on your hard drive in their raw format here. And they're not imported into DevonThink and converted into some kind of custom file type that stops you getting it back out, like Evernote used to do back in the day. In fact, you can take a file, duplicate it, move it, do whatever you want. So don't worry about losing files that go in there. You can get them out. And I will cover importing and indexing and getting stuff out of DevonThink in the next video in the series. So that's a standard database. Now, what can I do with this encrypted one? Well, let's try opening it from here. We can see it's not allowed. You just cannot open it. So can I cheat and right click and show the package contents? Well, no, I can't do that either. The option isn't there. And that's because it's not a normal database file. It's a sparse image file. And the option just doesn't appear in our context menu. It's not something you can do. So that is a brief intro into Dev and Think and how you can create databases. In the next video, we'll look at importing and indexing files. And if that's something that you want to know about, like and subscribe and you'll be told exactly when it's dropped. Thanks everyone, stay safe and see you soon.